absolutely love this time of year. And in preparation of Good Friday, I was reading through Psalm 22 over and over and over. And, and Psalm 22 is just so wonderful. And I think it, it, it'd be appropriate that we look at Psalm 22 this morning as we start today to commemorate the last week of Jesus' life as it were. Uh, for Christians, Jesus' work in life holds sway in all of our thoughts, hopes, and dreams. This week begins today, as I said, on Palm Sunday. Jesus' whole life was moving towards this one week. Jesus enters Jerusalem with the purpose of laying down his life. All of the Gospel of Matthew is about an ascent of Jesus, an ascent to Jerusalem where he would inevitably lay his life down. But it didn't seem like that initially. You know what we missed? The call to worship. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to put a pin in the call to worship, Stan. You want to do it next week? Let's do it next week. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Just yeah. all the excitement of the kids and stuff. You all got to speak up. I mean, I think that's why John and, and the guys didn't get the, the, the uh, offertory. They're like, we got to call the worship we missed, right? Say something, boys. That's why God gave you all voices. I'm very sorry. I apologize because it was a beautiful text. Um, but again, this week starts out quite differently than as it ends. It starts off in a triumphant manner of Jesus riding this colt that had never been ridden, and he goes into Jerusalem with cheers, the cheers of people. They roll out the red carpet, as it were. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had seen. And again, that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on earth. But Jesus knew in his heart that before that week was over, these cheers would turn to jeers for the most part. That those very ones that were possibly singing Hosanna, the king of David, would be saying, Crucify him, crucify him. We know that by the end of the week, <laughs> All of even his own disciples abandoned him. His, his, his main disciple uh, denies him. One of the very ones, his friend, betrays him to the high priest. Jesus was not only God and not man. He was God, the God-man. He felt pain and suffering like you and I feel. He felt rejection and sorrow like we feel. He was called the man of sorrows. Even in Luke 19, we see a, a uh, harbinger of what was to come. It says the chief priests in Luke 19, 27, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. And what I want to look at today is this very day that was the day of darkness, and it was literally dark from noon until three in Jerusalem, the day when Jesus laid down his life, paid the penalty that he didn't deserve for sinners like you and I. Hundreds of years before that, in Psalm 22, I believe what we have is prayers between the Father and between the Son foretold things that I think were going through Jesus' heart and mind during those three most important hours in the life of Jesus. Those Jewish leaders felt finally they were going to silence this Galilean preacher. Finally they would silence this man who seemed to have such authority, although he wasn't one of them, their authority in jeopardy. I think about the enemy who knew who this son of man was. This was going to be his time, his dark time, that he would finally silence Christ. But what's really going on is an incredible mystery of what God was actually doing 
in time and in space through the person and work of Jesus. John Wester was going to preach a sermon called Behold the Lamb of God. I'd like to look at Psalm 22 where, where we see a portrait of Jesus' final day, again, hundreds of years beforehand. King David wrote about his greater son, Jesus, and he gives us a picture of the Lamb of God that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God, who through Christ in those three hours would undo all the enemy that has been trying to do forever, and in a mysterious way, turn back sin, hell, death, and the grave. You know, you think about heroes. I, I think in our world, hero worship <laughs> happens. I remember as a little kid being, you all know I'm a Yankee fan, being Reggie Jackson was my hero, Ron Guidry, Thurman Munson, all those Yankees who introduced me to baseball. They won the World Series in 77 and 78. I think maybe more appropriately, some of us have heroes of our grandmas and our grandpas. And my grandma Vera Anderson will ever be a hero to me. Again, the lady who demonstrated love for Christ and brought me to Sunday school. She loved the Lord's Lord. Not just that, she played dominoes with me <laughs> when I got home from school, investing in me. Maybe your hero is your dad or mom. Um, again, in my life, God gave me a mother <coughs> who was sacrificial, who I could call on day or night. She was that one person I could count on no matter what was happening in the world. Heroes, heroes of people. Um, you think about war heroes. Uh, I think Whenever I see on Veterans Day and I see these guys wearing their hats, I can't help but go up to them and thank them for their service to our country. These folks are heroes. The Medal of Honor is the United States of America's highest and most prestigious per personal military decoration that may be awarded to recognize U.S. military service members who have distinguished themselves by acts of valor, conspicuous gallantry, and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, I want to tell you about one particular American hero. Lance Corporal William Kyle Carpenter of Gilbert, South Carolina, population 600, was one of these type of heroes. He fell on a grenade for his brother Marine, Nicholas Infazio, who was Kyle's best friend. Uh, if you've ever been a Marine, I hear about these guys. Your best friend is that guy in that foxhole next to you. Well, what he did was he loved him like a brother. Carpenter fell on a, a hand grenade. And in falling on that hand grenade, Carpenter lost his right eye. He needed shrapnel removed from his brain. He had penetrating wounds through his uh, carotid artery and neck. He had 30 fractures to his arm and shrapnel in both his legs and lost all of his lower teeth. Both eardrums punctured, lost most of his jaw. He collapsed, his right lung collapsed. He flatlined three times, and he needed 40 surgeries. He was in the diving posture and came up just short of totally falling on that hand grenade, and the body armor at that moment was shattered in uh, November 21st, 2010. Lance Corporal Officer Kyle Carpenter was just 21 years old. I think any one of us would agree he was a hero. That he, he, he put his life in jeopardy, he didn't die, he suffered greatly, but that's, that's love, I think, personified. It says that if you were to put, he said, if you were to put a thousand Marines in his place, they would all fall on a grenade for him, so he would do the same for them. And he received this Medal of Honor from the President for his heroism in Afghanistan. Heroes. But folks, is there no greater hero than our Lord Jesus Christ? If, if we're willing to pour our lives out for our grandchildren, for our children, if soldiers are willing to pour their lives out for one another to, to protect and save one another, don't you see that that's exactly what Christ has done for us? The greatest hero of all time. I remember this um, song from the 80s. 
the greatest cowboy to ever ride. I don't know if you ever heard it. Um, but it's G Jesus, right? The greatest cowboy, the greatest white hat you'll have ever. But if we're going to, as we look here at this Psalm 22, I want to focus on those three hours in the life of, again, the greatest hero ever. What we're going to find in these first 21 verses of this psalm is what I believe to be the inner prayers and thoughts of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. This indeed is the psalm of the cross, as Spurgeon said. We will find this to be what is going on in Jesus' heart, I believe, from noon until 3 p.m. while he hung on the cross at Calvary that fateful day. I agree with James Montgomery Boyce that what we find is an alternating prayers by Jesus to his Father and depicting the suffering Jesus endured <coughs> on the cross. Crucifixion, as we know, was the worst form of, of, of execution, uh, of suffering that a person could endure. Not just suffering, but the humiliation and the painfulness that goes along with it, being humiliated and hanging on a cross until dead. The day Jesus became the greatest hero ever is the day he hung on that tree for me. Those three hours he spent suffering on my behalf. He, by far, is my greatest hero. The reason I love Easter is because everything else pales in comparison to the love of God expressed to us in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, Charles Haddon Spurgeon says this, this is beyond all others, the psalm of the cross. It begins with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And ends according to some in the original with, it is finished. For plaintive expressions uprising from unuttered depths of woe, we may say of this psalm, there is none like it. It is the photograph of our Lord's saddest hours, the record of his dying words, the memorial of his expiring joys. Before us, we have a description both of the darkness and the glory of the cross, the sufferings of Christ and the glory which shall follow. Oh, for the grace to draw near and see this great sight. We should read reverently, putting off our shoes, for, as Spurgeon says, we are on holy ground, as if it were the ground of which Moses trod on when you read this psalm. To be able to be let in to the inner heart and thoughts of God is just amazing, and, 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 and just the mysteries within this psalm. So again, my title today is The Great Cost of Salvation, Saved by a Hero. And so let's stand together and read this together. Psalm, I'm going to read it if you'd stand with me. Psalm 22, 1 through 21. I want to see prayer to his faithful father. I want to see prayer to his trustworthy father and prayer to his father who saves. Psalm 22, verses 1 through 21. To the chief musician, set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm in no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. 
Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging, roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleave, clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclo has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Father God, we thank you for your word here today, Lord. I pray, Father, that you might tenderize our hearts, Father, that you might help us put out the cares and the concerns of the world, and that even for this moment, we might be able to truly look into your word, Father, and God, that you'd open our hearts, that we might comprehend to a certain degree the depths of the love that you have Put forth in giving your own dear son to be a propitiation, to be a sacrifice, to pay the penalty that we deserved on that cross, Lord God, and then to rise again, not only for our justification, but to give us great hope and promise, Lord, now and forevermore. Thank you for your word, God, and we pray that you would bless it to our ears and help me, Lord, to preach it well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Prayer to his faithful father. As you see there, it opens up, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my mouth? Jesus makes it clear that he was meditating, I think, on this psalm as he hung on the cross that fateful day. Jesus in anguish and in pain. It says from 12 noon till 3 as he hung there. Matthew records it this way. As Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think it's important that we understand what's going on during these three hours. That we can see this relationship between the Father and the relationship with the Son. That, that could the father actually forsake his son? It's important to comprehend that all of history boils down to this historic moment as Christ hangs on that cross. If we can understand what's going on during these three hours, then these three hours will have the most impact on our lives the rest of every hour we live out looking to what Jesus has done. These three hours are the heart of the gospel. These three hours of extreme suffering in the life of Jesus changed the world forever. Especially for those that believe, but also for those that don't believe. This is Jesus in the gospel. It's a point of judgment for those that reject him. But it's a point of salvation for those that embrace and feel the import of what God has done. This is the time when God lets us inside the thoughts, I think, of Jesus. Jesus, at this point, is praying to his faithful Father. But you are holy, verses 3 through 5, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and you delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. I think as Jesus hangs on that cross, feeling completely abandoned by his father, it reminds him of the prayers of the faithful to God. He encourages himself in this fact that God is holy, that he would not let him down. Even as he hangs on that cross, I think you remember he says that everyone had, had left him, but the father was there. But this moment 
as Christ hangs on the cross, feeling completely abandoned by his father. He could remember the prayers of Abraham, that Abraham would pray and God would deliver him, that Moses would pray and God would deliver them. Surely he would deliver Jesus in his greatest time of suffering. Maybe Jesus is remembering back to the Israelites. The Israelites are always an example to us, folks that were hard-hearted and, and, and reprobate in so many ways, but God never abandoned them in the wilderness. In Numbers 21, it says, And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. They loathed the manna from heaven. God who directed them day and night and gave them food to eat. Their sandals did not wear out, but this was a faithless and ungrateful people. They deserved to die, and God did bring judgment on some of them. Fiery serpents were sent to bite and kill many of them that day in the desert until they cried out for mercy. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord, they told Moses, that he would take away the serpents from us. God was faithful to deliver them that day. It's very interesting that the Father delivers Israel that day by this uh, making a fiery serpent, setting it up on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who was bitten, as they look at that, they would live. So Moses made that serpent, that pole, that they would look up to and they would deliver. Many died that day, but many received mercy. The very ones that were rejecting Christ, that were rejecting God, that were, were, were grumbling in the desert, even after enjoying so much of his incredible mercy and love to them. So this even, and that scripture, as we know, when in John is made very clear that that was a harbinger in looking forward to what the Father would do in Jesus. Here in Psalm 22, we see that suffering that occurred on Calvary in a conversation, this prayer between the Father and the Son. But John says this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Even those of us who have been reprobate, lost, sinners, even Christians, taking God's mercy and grace for granted, we can look to Christ and be forgiven. We can look to Christ and be redeemed. That very Christ, that emblem of suffering and pain is the way for wicked sinners like you and I to find forgiveness. Who would ever think that it would be done this way through the suffering and the pain of the Son of God? Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was accomplishing salvation that day. God, the faithful Father, he prayed to as he hung on the cross, had turned his face away from Christ for that moment. He pours his wrath for sin out on the Son that day. But now we can all look to Christ and find forgiveness. We can look to Christ and be healed of all our sins. Given eternal life. We receive life only because Christ suffered death. Maybe Jesus was thinking about Habakkuk, where it says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Jesus was taking the penalty for sin that day. Adam, as a representative for mankind, brought sin into the world and death through sin. But Jesus now, who represented a new humanity by living that sinless life and then going to that awful cross, was paying the penalty that we might be forgiven. That not only we can have life, that we can be the people God's calling us to. But it didn't come by any easy task. It came through the sinless Son of God, the perfect sinless sacrifice dying on that cross. That day, he became sin for us who trust in him. James Montgomery Boyce says it this way, 
I do not hesitate to say that according to the teacher of the New Testament, excuse me, excuse me, according to the teaching of the New Testament, Jesus was indeed forsaken by God while he bore the sin of his people on the cross. This is the very essence of the atonement, Jesus bearing our hell in order that we might share his heaven. To be forsaken means to have the light of God's countenance and the sense of his presence eclipsed, which is what happened to Jesus as he bore the wrath of God against sin for us. You think about the relationship of the Father and the Son, and it we can't even imagine the felicity of the type of relationship that the Father and the Son enjoyed, the type of love that was between the two of them. But for this moment, as Jesus had added to himself humanity, the very God whom he never had been separated from, in his flesh, in the person of the incarnate Christ, God has to turn his way, his head away, and pour out on him all of his wrath. Mm -hmm. So that sin, its penalty might be satisfied. Jesus is my hero. Is he your hero? He died so I can live. He died so my sins might be forgiven. God frowned on Jesus, as it were, when he became sin for us, that he might smile on the believer. You know, we always end in a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord's face can't shine upon you unless he turned his face away from Christ. That's right. All those that might be able to have the relationship and, and, a, and a God who now can look on him with love is because of what Christ did. Prayer to his trustworthy father, part two here. Suffering. Listen to the suffering. You know, this, this wasn't, you know, if I was the father, you know, I was always the good cop at home. <laughs> you know, well, I didn't, when we had the discipline, we had the discipline, but I'm always trying to find a way to kind of smooth things over. Please, just listen so you don't have to be spanked. Or, please, please, right? But, but it has to be done. But, but here, God did not hold back. Jesus did not get through in an easy manner. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with suffering. And the psalmist makes it very clear, but I am a worm and no man, verse 6, a reproach of men and despised by people. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. This, of course, reminiscent of Matthew 27, when those chief priests and their mocking and the scribes and the elders. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The reproach, the suffering, the Humiliation. During this suffering, Jesus prays a second time. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. I think maybe as Jesus is hanging there, you have to remember, first and foremost, in order to understand the gospel and the import of this suffering, Jesus was 100% human. He was a man like you and I. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was the hope of all hope. He was finally that seed that would come, that would ultimately finally crush the head of the serpent. There was no other child that had more hope and promise than Christ. Maybe him sitting there and thinking about hearing from heaven, you're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But here at this moment, he's suffering this type of reproach. Now at his lowest point, Jesus prays to his trustworthy father. It's just natural when you're dying, you think of God, you think of your loved ones, when you're in those most desperate situations, 
You hear of people, their last thoughts, they prayed to God, God forgive me, or they thought about mom, mom's gonna miss me. Same thing here with Lance Corporal Officer Kyle Carpenter. He was 21 years old, he was a hero who had just saved the life of his best friend, but now he lay in a pool of blood, he tells us, as he felt his life fading away as he was bleeding out. He was sure this would be his last moments on this earth. He said he thought first to say a prayer for forgiveness to God and for all he had done wrong in his life, and he thought about how much his mom would miss him. So it's appropriate for Jesus, who is and was the God-man, to have these same sorts of thoughts. This was not, he was sinless, but he was a man like you and I. He suffered the pain, he suffered the humiliation, and he suffered this separation from his father. He who was the greatest promise. Ever since then, there's been this hope that there might be a man. We had that promise in the garden that one day that there would be a seed that would come, there would be enmity between them, and he would crush the head of that serpent, and that serpent would bruise his heel. Finally, this was that man. But the way it was accomplished is ever so different than what you would think. But you've got to realize that Jesus was a man, but he was also the God-man, the second person of the Trinity, whom from all eternity has had that perfect relationship with the Lord. There could have been no other man that could ever have accomplished this, because we know man, don't we? All we like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But this one man, this God-man, the second person of the Trinity, never, ever, ever sinning even once, yet having this reproach of his Father poured out on him. <clears throat> Hebrews says it this, this way, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Think of that. The biggest fear that man experiences is fear of death. You ask, I mean, the biggest fear. Children come to the Lord because they know, you know what, especially Louise has been preaching about hell. <laughs> My grandkids are coming home and going, am I going to die, Daddy? Yeah, you're going to die. We're all going to die. And it's a very fearful thing to enter into it apart from what Christ has done. But now, because Christ took upon himself the form of a man so that he might destroy the power of death, the devil, and all of us who in all of our lifetime have been in bondage to that type of fear are set free. Therefore, in all things, the Hebrew writer says, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. Again, to make propitiation, that he might receive the penalty, the, the, the wrath of God poured out to propitiate, to turn away God's anger and wrath from us. You see, he had to experience the full brunt of the wrath of God. I don't know if you can imagine that. Think of your own child. It's easier to think about good whipping when they've been naughty. But this son has never done anything wrong. He's the perfect son of God. And he has the wrath of God poured out on him. I think about the state that he left from. I always talk about Christ becoming man. It wasn't enough. I mean, it was enough of a humiliation and an emptying of himself just to become a man, right? But he goes further. In Philippians it says it wasn't just that, but it was not just the humiliation and the emptying of himself and, and becoming a man uh, and taking no, re no reputation upon himself, but it says further, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus, during this time on the cross, is bearing the wrath and curse of God for all who had looked forward to him and all who looked back to him and trust in him. That's what this week's about. 
You know, I want to rush to, to resurrection day. We're going to get there. But folks, the road to the resurrection is the road that our Lord had taken. And as a Catholic growing up, we'd always have uh, the sign of the cross. I mean, who's Catholic? Anybody Catholic or Catholic? Right? So they, they go through each, and listen, man, it's moving. What Christ suffered and went through, the beating, the humiliation, the beard pull, the spitting on, him carrying his own cross up to Golgotha and falling down. You know, I don't remember where in the scripture says two or three times, but the Catholics got it. And listen, it is moving. This is what God has done for us in Christ. We'll look on Friday night at Isaiah. It's so beautiful. Isaiah 53 kind of explains it beautifully. He was taken from prison, from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. He died on the cross for us. If you trust in him today. He was stricken, although we ought to have been. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. It pleased the Lord. This was God's mercy and love. Romans, it says, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. It's wonderful. It pleased the Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Verse 11, Psalm 22. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Finally, prayer to his Father who saves. Doing my best not to look at the clock. I'm actually doing okay. I knew it was a longer sermon. I thought if I didn't look at the clock, I wouldn't feel like I have to rush. But um, it's just... This so moves me, this psalm, and this week so moves me. Folks, this, we talked about Adam. Adam was a historical man who fell in history and in time. Because of that, God had to send Christ, the last Adam. He had to be a historical man who lived in space and in time, perfectly righteous and sinless, but that he might die on that cross. As, as, as Francis Schaeffer says, if we were there, we could have gotten a sliver on that cross. This is just not old wives' tales or, or anything. This is real life history. So finally, now Jesus enters those final moments of his life. Here in this psalm, hundreds of years before the crucifixion, we see through the prophet's words about the crucifixion Jesus suffers to secure salvation and hear his inner prayers to his Father who saves. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. Here in John, we see the confirmation that Psalm 22 was the fulfillment that day on Calvary. John records this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. If possible, David, explaining in detail what Christ suffered during those three hours hanging on that cross. To secure salvation. All things accomplished. Salvation secured in the death of Jesus. He said there in verse 15, you have brought me to the dust of death. The wages of sin is death. And then it goes on to so explain the crucifixion, verse 16 through 18. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is how Jesus is brought there to the dust of death. This is when the payment for sin is being paid in full. 
What an amazing description of this crucifixion, this suffering of Christ, this piercing of the Son of God, all the accounting, as it were, of his, his bones being out of joint. I, I know I've seen this on a bumper sticker, and I think I've said it before, and it's really corny, but it's, it, it's the, thing, the bumper sticker says, how much, they ask Jesus, how much do you love me? And he says, this much, and he reaches out his arms and he dies. But that, that, that humiliating crucifixion is the absolute expression of the love of God so that he might be able to make up that gap, that infinite gap between a holy and perfect God and sinful men and women like you and I. No greater love, Jesus for sure is my hero. He gave all for this sinner. We must trust in him. Either this really moves your heart, or you don't really comprehend what your salvation cost. If you don't understand the great value at which God has purchased us, your commitment to him will be only as great as we can really comprehend what happened those three hours as Jesus hung on that cross. That's the sort of thing that gets you up in the morning and says, you know what, God? Help me. Strengthen me. I want to serve you more today. I want to honor you more. You've emptied heaven for me. Jesus was naked and dying on the cross. <clears throat> the last bit of humiliation was in his crucifixion. It says this, Then they crucified him, divided his garments, and casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothes they cast lots. Matthew quotes Psalm 22. Spurgeon, I think, says it wonderfully. The first Adam made us all naked, and therefore the second Adam became naked, that he might clothe our naked souls. Amen. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned? First thing they felt was embarrassment, shame. They ran to hide themselves because of their transgression. The shame is taken away because Christ took all of that shame for us in the cross, on the cross. So once again, verses 19 through 21, but you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild ox. Jesus does end up dying that day. And his prayer, though, as we know, is answered. In his death is salvation. Ultimately, in his forsakenness, he accomplishes all that we need that we might be redeemed. Forsaken, smitten, stricken on our behalf that we might be saved. They will come, it says, verse 31, and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. We are that people who declare the righteousness of Christ. John 19 records it this way. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. You know, I read about that story about that Lance Corporal who, without even thinking through his body, on that hand grenade to save his friend. I don't know what emotions or what feeling he had there. It was just uh, a reaction. What Christ has done, what God has done in and through Christ is no happenstance. Just jumping out a grenade for us. Right. This was planned out. Yeah. This was foreordained from before the foundations of the earth. We can't understand the depths of wickedness and sin. We see it this week in what happened 
in Nashville, and it just breaks our heart. I can't understand it, but I know somehow God is going to bring good out of evil. That's what was going on on that cross, that, that, that all of the powers of sin and the devil had, had reared everything, the most evil day ever. But what good has come out of what God has done for us in Christ? He's able. <clears throat> Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus demonstrated the greatest love of anyone ever in the history of man. There is no um, other superstars, as it were. You, know, you think about those, your heroes you cheer for, the game-winning home run, the touchdown that wins the Super Bowl, or even Kyle Carpenter saving his friend, but there is nothing there is nothing that infinitely even compares, obviously, to the sacrifice of God in giving his own dear son that we might be made right with him. That's what this week's about. It's leading towards the Last Supper when Jesus is going to commemorate what he's about to do, that his body would be broken, his blood would be spilled, that in his blood there would be a new covenant to create a new people who are able to, to be made right with God, and then to bring this message of love to a world that needs it ever so greatly. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-one. You have answered me. We get the answer for sure that all of Jesus' prayers are heard and that they are answered. The Father saved the Son and delivered him by resurrecting him three days later. <laughs> Hell could not hold him down. The enemy's devices could not keep him in that grave. And what the wonder of wonders is we'll see next week or the week after in Romans chapter 6 is that those who believe in him are buried with him. And we rise again to new life. New life now and new life eternally with him forever. Death has been vanquished forever. In conclusion, James Montgomery Boyce says this, and we can come bring our, our musicians can come forward. James Montgomery Boyce again puts it quite well. In what is probably the greatest of all of Charles Wesley's hymns, that great evangelist and poet of the Methodist Church asks, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me from him to death pursued. That possibility was so wonderful to Wesley, Boyce says, that he composed this entire hymn, 180 in your hymnals, around describing this amazing love, this mystery, the death, beyond all ability that even angels could fathom. But though he could not exhaust its meaning or even cease to marvel at such love, Wesley knew that it was indeed for him that Christ died and that his only hope of salvation lay in atonement. That's what we ought to here today, Christian, recognize what amazing love. And can it be? Why would Christ die for a worm like you or I? So Charles says, tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. So again, the real question here today is, in those three hours, our lives are completely transformed. Did he die for you and me who are sinners who caused his pain? Do we trust in what Jesus has done in paying the penalty for our sin? Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Let, let's stand and sing that awesome hymn together. Mm -hmm.